there. Welcome to the first inaugural. Well, that would be first, right? Inaugural First Friday's Talk, which is part of the programming for UNC Greensboro Special Collections and University Archives 50th anniversary celebration. My name is Beth Ann Kelsch, and today I'm happy to welcome my colleagues, Stacy Krim, who is the curator of manuscripts here, and David Gwynn, the digitization coordinator for the libraries. Uh, for a short conversation about the Triad Black Lives Matter project. So welcome Stacy and David. And uh, can you give us a quick timeline of the project? Sure. So um, the project actually happened at lightning speed as far as um, archival projects happen. George Floyd, of course, was murdered on May 25th, 2020. And uh, the events trickled down eventually to Greensboro, where we had our first protest uh, five days later. We began the project on June 10th, 2020. Uh, before that, we knew we had to start something. We just weren't entirely certain what the form was going to take. OK, so um, can you tell us how the material was added to your collection? Uh, one, what we really wanted to do was make it as easy as possible for community members to uh, to contribute material. So we created a web form, basically, so that people could go into the website, uh, actually just upload their images there. We, in the process, were also trying to make it um, because of the sensitive nature potentially of some of the uh, some of the photographs that we could be including. We we're trying to make it as uh, secure as possible for people. So we we're offering, we we're allowing people to submit and not have their names attached to the material. We also were offering to do metadata scrubbing so that uh, we could pull out, for example, GPS coordinates of photographs, et cetera, um, because that had traditionally in some other instances been used against people who were participating in some of the protests. So we wanted to make it as easy as, and secure as possible. Um, who was actually, or how we were actually dealing with the material, we were incorporating it into our existing community collections program at UNCG uh, in the Gateway Digital Collections platform. Our community contributed collections are collections where we actually don't acquire material, physical material from the community, but we allow people to contribute their materials either in digital format or actually lending us material that we can then scan put online and return to them. We've worked with a lot of individuals and with community organizations over the years. Um, and uh, it's sort of a new area for us. And uh, the Black Lives Matter project was kind of new territory within that area. In the past, we'd actually, uh, and we're still also working on a project called Pride of the Community, which is a community-based project documenting the LGBTQ plus community in the triad area. The Black Lives Matter project actually uh, became kind of a uh, bigger issue, though, because we were actually documenting an event as it happened. Um, we were working directly with the artists who were putting together some of the artwork, um, and they were actively involved in the project as well and contributing material. Right. And we did actually collect some physical material. That was one of the challenges since we weren't out and about, which we'll talk about later. The photos uh, David is showing right now are actually of Amari Brown, who is an artist who contributed three uh, pan plywood panels of art that were featured on Elm Street during the protests. So Amari is a Greensboro artist. And when during the uh, protest, the plywood panels were put up all around Elm Street, uh, predominantly over windows and doors. And multiple artists uh, just on their own will came down to, um, to paint those. And if you go back, David, actually, in, um, in, within our collection, we actually have, uh, go forward one. One more. One more. So we have this, this uh, particular piece of plywood art with Storm and uh, Black Panther. He very much took his um, inspiration from comic book characters. And uh, in speaking with him, what he was really hoping to do was 
teach children and encourage children to be involved with social justice, that they would be superheroes uh, by getting involved. And you see those themes in his artwork. We also, uh, sorry. Sorry, it's okay. Our team consisted of multiple people. We had people within university libraries, but also we teamed with Dr. Tara T. Green of the African American and Diaspora Studies Department and Women and Gender Studies Department. And part of uh, the project was actually oral histories with activists uh, involved with the protests, as well as artists. Um, those oral histories were, were one of the challenges we have, which we'll talk about in a minute. One of the things that we felt was very important too is because this artwork was actually in many cases painted on plywood that was actually used to to board up or uh, fortify or just added to the fronts of buildings. Some in some cases actually as a canvas. Um, we felt that uh, we will sit in the, the Greensboro History Museum actually collected a lot of the physical artwork because they have the space for display, etc. We also felt it was very important to document the artwork in its original context downtown. So uh, we have from both people within UNCG and community contributors as well, a lot of photographs of the artwork on the actual buildings as it appeared, well, I don't want to say live, but at, at the time you know, on, in the streetscape of Elm Street in downtown Greensboro. Uh, one other thing that we felt was very important to the process too was uh, making sure that we were documenting the artists that were involved in creating the material within the metadata, um, and in fact, uh, uh, literally this moment as we speak, I have another staff member going through some of the items that were missed recently and, and actually going back and retrospectively adding the uh, artist names, which in some cases, all we have is an Instagram handle or something, but we're trying to put as much information out there as possible about who the actual artists were. Yeah, so, we love, we have many oral history pro projects in our collection. And this was the first time we've ever had to deal with um, video remote oral histories. Our best practices was always to have oral histories in person if possible. And then we would do phone interviews. But of course, during COVID, Zoom came around. Um, so we had a new tool to use for oral histories, but it took us a while to adapt to Zoom uh, and to figure out how best to conduct those oral histories. Here, uh, you can see Dr. Green in the, the corner speaking. And uh, one of the challenges is when you're speaking in person during an oral history, you're making a personal connection um, as with, with the person telling their story. Um, we had to figure out best ways to work around that, work around bandwidth issues. So there were all sorts of technological challenges which I feel may anticipate Beth Ann's next question. Right, <laughs> what were some of those challenges or obstacles you faced during the project? Right, so of course, during this, uh, we were in the midst of COVID. So at university libraries, most of us were working from home. Um, and uh, of course, people were supposed to be in isolation. They were not supposed to go out. This was pre-vaccine. So you, you were in fear of being out and around people. So communication with each other was a bit challenging at first. Um, we, one of the, the hardest parts for me for a, it being a community collection is uh, we couldn't really go out and interact with the community. Usually with community collections, we team up with a community organization. We sit down and build that relationship. We're, we're talking to them in person. Um, we didn't have that opportunity. This collection was very much, um, a, in some ways it was a truer community collection in that it was multiple individuals submitting to us uh, their experiences primarily through digital mediums. Um, and again, as we mentioned, one of the other concerns, one of the other obstacles we faced, though it proved not to be as big an obstacle as we thought it might have been, was the issue of privacy with uh, submitted photographs and scrubbing the, uh, scrubbing the metadata, et cetera, which we actually didn't end up needing to do on any of the uh, projects. So we didn't have, or any of the photos, so we didn't have any requests for that. But um, you know, it was a thing that we were thinking about and being mindful of all the way through the process. You know, as archivists, it's unusual for us to think about documenting things as they happen. 
Yeah, um, actually, this would probably be our first uh, digital collection that is um, primarily digitally driven by born digital material. It was uh, primarily consisting of people pulling out their phones uh, and taking videos and photographs, although we did get some some additional material. We also got flyers and, and documents that were all uh, digital. So uh, it was a bit of a transition for us and we knew it was coming. This was the first time we were able to test that out. And it was really wonderful to see um, in, a, in a documenting the protests and the events as they were unfolding. unfolding um, you could see through the videos people were taking, they were focusing on what they thought was important. So if you have um, a video of someone participating in the protest or walking down Elm Street looking at art, they're focusing on what they think is interesting. Um, so you're getting their perspective. It's not necessarily um, us curating the material. There's very little curation on our part other than making it, putting it online and making it accessible. And I think that's part of the strength of a project like this is what we can do is contribute the infrastructure and the uh, the expertise we have for getting these materials online. So other people can be the ones actually telling the stories. Um, okay. Go ahead. Oh, I was just gonna ask about how large is the collection and are you still adding to it? We are actually. Uh, the collection currently is at nearly 750 items, uh, and among those, over 700 of those items are photographs. We have 17 oral histories online, and uh, there are also pamphlets, etc. And the photos are a mixed bag. They're, uh, they're local photos, but we also have some photos that were shot in other locales in North Carolina and around the country, and at some earlier uh, events in Greensboro and in Winston-Salem as well. So there's a lot, there's actually a lot of a uh, a lot of depth to the collection as well, I think. And it's still added. We are, we are still taking okay. any materials that people in the community would like to contribute. Look on that as a solicitation, if you will. Yeah, if you have photos on your phone before and you think they may be relevant to this uh, project and you're willing to to let us borrow them and put them online, uh, please let us let us know because um, phones don't last forever. <laughs> so we want to make certain we're going to get the documentation as much documentation as we can. But not that's just. Kind of the, no, sorry. Oh, sorry. I was just going to say that's kind of the difference between documenting a project like this. Uh, using uh, commercial platforms, be it Instagram, Flickr, et cetera. The idea is that we're in this for the long haul. So we will actually be documenting and preserving this material in perpetuity. Whereas, you know, your actual social media channels have a tendency to go away after time, so. Okay, so, but besides, you know, things on people's phones, um, is every single thing born, you know, born digital, which basically means, you know, it's it's out there in the the ones and the zeros of you know right. computer computer talking. <laughs> no, we did get physical material. So uh, in addition to Amari's artwork, um, actually we have a an exhibit on the first floor of Jackson Library by the reference desk. In the photo where you saw him pointing at his uh, artwork on Elm Street, we actually he actually donated his clothing as well. So that's among the things we have on exhibit. Also, there was an earlier photo of a man and a woman holding a sheet with John Lewis painted on it. That was donated. That's actually a very fascinating piece because the, the bed sheet actually uh, was John Lewis's bed sheet. Someone donated it to the artist and the artist then pure, put a mural on it. The artist is um, Robert Talley. And the uh, event that they were painting that particular mural and using it at was actually in Winston-Salem. Um, so we do collect uh, physical material. Um, so t-shirts, face masks, um, anything that might be relevant and distinctive to uh, the Black Lives Matter movement in Greensboro, especially during the protest. That's great. Um, so how would people get in contact with you if they wanted to contribute materials to the project? Sorry, I'm clicking really fast now. There we go. Okay. 
And also, so, oh, this is a double, a double bonus slide. So besides <laughs> how to contact you, this is also if you, how to um, access the collection. So as Stacy mentioned, in Jackson Library right now, there is an exhibit, but um, the, you know, as this is essentially a digital project, um, you know, it's mostly gonna live online. So please. Uh, and you can actually, as you see up in the uh, right hand uh, panel, you can actually contribute materials directly from the site and also contact us as well. Mm -hmm. And I would like to say uh, we actually, while the exhibit, while the project was being constructed, um, we had two classes using this material as part of their assignments, their class assignments. So this has already been incorporated into our curriculum. Um, and we had it used in the um, Dr. Green's Black Lives Matter class actually. And she actually had her students go out and do oral histories with people who participated in the protest or recording people's experiences of the events and how they felt about them. And those oral histories were added to the collection. So they're part of the collection. And Dr. Nicole Scalese had her class actually write essays and poetry um, inspired by the photographs of art and protest within the collection that she the class donated towards the collection. So we will be putting those up. Wow, that's great. Uh, anything else you wanted to add? Um, no, I, I, I think we can leave it open to questions. Okay, so if you have any questions uh, for David or Stacy, if you could type them in the chat, we'll um, give people a few moments. We'll have the awkward silence while people decide if they want to ask a question. Um, this is where we just kind of stare, nod. While, while we're waiting, I want to thank everyone um, who tuned in and we're very excited to continue these first Friday presentations. You know, kind of we're excited about what we do and we want to share it with people. Okay, I'm thinking maybe the awkward time is up. Um, if you have questions, oh wait, uh, we have somebody who would like to know about The Rock. Sure. Ex explain what The Rock is and not the actor, right? You yeah. can't stop The Rock, can't stop. Oh, him. right. Not that he would be unwelcome in this collection, no, in, our, in our archive, mm -hmm. yeah. but uh, so during COVID, actually starting a bit before the George Floyd murder, um, we had students actively expressing their emotions on campus in various ways. Um, and during COVID, um, many people, of course, were not on our campus, so they didn't see this, but actually students came in and, and painted messages on the rock. And the rock, for those of you who are not UNCG people, um, is a, um, it's a it is a giant rock. Um, it's at a location on campus where student groups are allowed to spray paint and do artwork or messages about what they're doing in their groups. So um, we documented that uh, we had, I think there were two different paintings on uh, the rock, the main rock. And then students also got creative. Of course, in the course of landscaping at a university, you have all these little uh, pebbles and stones. So students were painting pebbles and stones and putting them all over campus uh, with messages relating to the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, and uh, we, we went around looking for them and I was able to photograph, there's the rock. Um, that's actually the second, uh, second message that was on it. And um, this was another smaller one that was in that area. Um, we, we've located um, kind of the guerrilla art portions. Uh, one was in front of the alumni house in the mulch. One was uh, in the mulch by a tree when you came out of the parking decks. There's the one that's over by the, was over by the alumni house. And that one probably predated George Floyd's murder. Um, so we uh, of course photographed them. 
uh, two of the examples ended up in university archives. So those are actually on exhibit on, in the exhibit cases by the reference desk. Um, but you still may be able to find some of that artwork around campus. So if you do take a photo of it and uh, send it to us and let us know where it's located and we'll put it in the collection. Great, uh, we have someone else has a question. How will this project serve as a template for future projects collecting historical materials as the events unfold? I think it can't help but serve as something of a template because it's the first time really that we've ever ever done it. Uh, you know, as I mentioned earlier, we have a community collections program where we're actually actively working with members of the community and this sort of fits into that very well um, and is sort of the next the next phase in that, if you will, and I hope that we are able to do more of this. Um, I think, you know, understanding, I think the big, the big trick here is getting the word out that we're doing the collecting and that people have the uh, option of submitting materials. Um, and I will let the actual archivist in the room speak to this a little more closely. Sure, so as I mentioned, uh, normally our model is going to a community group and organizing through them. I think what we were experiencing with the Black Lives Matter protest collection will be the model for, uh, for documenting events as they unfold in the future. Um, as I said, this is the first time we've ever done it and it was, it was very successful. People were very, very enthusiastic about contributing. Um, there are many citizen documenters around now who understood that they, what they were experiencing was historic. Uh, and the more we can get that enthusiasm, um, I, I think it will greatly benefit um, the historic record, but also the people uh, who are going to be able to learn from it in the future. As I said, this is being included in classes, but it also fills in gaps, it will fill in a gap of civil rights history in Greensboro. Um, so when you look at uh, the protest, the protest aligned with the sit-ins, the Greensboro massacre, um, among other things, uh, you will see a, a, a giant theme of civil rights as it progresses or changes in Greensboro. So I, I think this will be the model we use um, as we are as we are experiencing events. And that's one thing uh, we were all aware of is um, every incident of police brutality that was on the news, every time there was a court, uh, you know, appearance, hearing, we were having to prepare in the background in case there was another protest. Um, so we were, we were actually watching these to see if we needed to get out again or put out another call again, uh, which very much changes the very passive type of collecting we do where we're collecting 20 years after the fact. Um, so it, it's going to, it's going to have a huge impact on us. Okay. Uh, interesting timing for us too, and that we were moving to a new uh, platform for our digital collections, and we were able to see how well it held up to uh, mounting new collections of materials pretty quickly and on the fly, and, and it seems to have worked pretty well. So we're happy with that too. Maybe we can get like a firefighter's pole, so like when something big's <laughs> happening, you guys can slide down and and, and go get stuff. Um, we actually have one more. We have another question. So direct from Charlotte. Um, we'll, we'll compliment. Great project. Uh, this person would like to know. Hi, Don. Um, for how did you um, set up um, the connection with Dr. Uh, Green, and uh, did you meet her through instruction, or, or how how did you, you know? Right, so we've worked with Dr. Green on several projects. She is a wonderful person to work with. And actually what was happening was we, we were like, we need to start doing something. Um, and, and because we are, we are actually, we went out and took photographs as well. Um, and she contacted us after our first meeting and said, oh, are, are you gonna do anything? And we're like, yes, come, come with us. <laughs> um, so it was one of those, uh, those moments of um, just coming together. I think uh, people are aware we do these sorts of projects that we, our mission is to document community or to preserve the documentation of community history. Um, and we have a special focus on social justice and civil rights too. So um, this is our collecting area. We 
we have made it known to faculty, many faculty, that um, we are happy to team up with them um, for for building these types of projects. So um, if, if, if you, if anyone out there has an idea for a project, we'd love to talk to you. Okay, well, we're, now we've got the questions flowing. Um, have you been contacted by previously unidentified people in the photos or the videos in your collection? And how do you handle the privacy implications um, of photos that show people in potentially sensitive situations, such as attending protests? Okay, I'll take the first question, the first part of that question. So yeah, one of the problems we had was we were had all these photos of artists, artworks, we didn't know who the artist was. So our, our philosophy was we'll put them online and promote them and hopefully someone who is the artist or knows the artist will see them and get in touch with us. And that's exactly what happened. So the first uh, time the university promoted this collection, we the featured photo was a work of art and someone goes oh my god this is your artwork and he's like yes it is and then I get on Facebook and contact him and see if I can talk to him <laughs> um, and he actually uh, gave us more photos of his artwork and we were able to put his identification on we also asked the artist because there was a, a collective that formed out of this um, if they recognized any other artwork in the collection to let us know so um, we we did we did make communication with some of the artists. And as to the second point about the privacy concerns, um, ultimately with this collection, it did not surface because we didn't, we did not end up with a lot of photographs or videos of active protests that were in process. Uh, we were prepared to do whatever we needed to do to preserve privacy on those, whether it be um, scrubbing the metadata, GPS data, et cetera, or even potentially obscuring faces if needed to be. Um, fortunately, it did not come up at this point, but um, we were prepared for it if it did come up and we, we thought that it might. Okay, well. I hope that answered the question. Uh, <laughs> yes, thank you for the answer. Super interesting point, so. Excellent. Uh, I believe that's everything we have and we can um, end at within a half an hour. So that was our goal. So thanks everyone for coming. Um, again, we will be doing this every Friday. In fact, the first Friday of every month, um, you know, contact us if you have any follow-up questions. And thank you so much, um, Stacy and David and everyone here who has tuned in and we're going to be this has been recorded and we're going to put this on our special collections university archives YouTube channel. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.